Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you are joining in from. Thank you so much for being with us. I've got confirmation from different parts of the globe, starting from India to Middle East to you know uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, and many other countries. Your uh, continuous patronage is really, really appreciated. And if you are new to this uh, platform, uh, please do like, share, and subscribe so that it can reach many more leaders, decision makers, young professionals. My intent is to help all budding young professionals to have a platform where they can meet experts. They can meet people who have accomplished many things in their life. Uh, and a very interesting uh, guest that we have today is uh, Ms. Sangeeta Sumesh. She's a professional certified coach with ICF and a chartered accountant. So a very colorful background. Uh, I re released a teaser uh, about her book, Where is the Moolah, sometime back. Please do take time to watch that teaser. You will get an idea about her background, her humble beginnings in uh, Chennai, and how she grew uh, into a most sought after speaker, coach, and prolific author, and many, many roles uh, into one, including uh, a mother of two and a wonderful human being. So I take pleasure in welcoming Sangeeta to our uh, studio. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, for taking time and being with us. Hi, Bhaskar. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here as part of your show. Same here. And you know, uh, when I uh, saw your picture with our Honorable uh, Finance Minister, Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman, uh, in one of the social media platforms, that's when I got hooked. I said, uh, who is this lady, right? I know the uh, famous one. Uh, this must be a famous one too. And uh, my guess turned out to be right. Uh, really, really fortunate to get your acquaintance and uh, your friendship. Thank you so much. In thank fact, you. Uh, thank you for those kind words. In fact, your uh, books, both fiction as well as non-fiction category books, have really touched me. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier in one of our preparatory calls, uh, your fiction book, the first chapter is nothing less than a Hollywood uh, you know, thriller. Uh, that got me hooked and I completed the entire book. It's a wonderful book. Uh, uh, journey of self-discovery, I should say, for anyone. And then I moved on to What the Finance, then I moved on to Get High, and then finally, uh, you know, the recently launched book, Where's the Moolah? So, uh, congratulations. And uh, my, my immediate question is, where do you get time? How do you uh, do all these things? So, I think the key is to just have the intent, because once you have the intent, you'll always figure out a way to, you know, get your things done. Absolutely, absolutely. And what made you write a book? Oh, actually, I'm an accidental author. I never had plans to write anything. So it was a trip to Cambodia. I had a family vacation uh, in 2015, and I had visited the killing fields. Mm. And uh, from 1970 to 74, there was a mass genocide in Cambodia. So when I went there, you know, even now you'll find pieces of bones, nails, you know, just strewn all over and there's a huge tower erected with the skulls. I mean, it's, it's horrifying. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just did something to me and it got me thinking, what happens if man is so cruel, mm. right? And kind of unknowingly, I had weaved the story in my head about it. And then uh, after a few months, you know, I thought like, why don't I write about it? But then, you know, the inner voice always says, oh, you're not an author who's going to read it, forget it and all that. Then luckily, I think uh, quite a few months later, that is almost one and a half years later, I chanced upon a 100-day book authoring challenge. And you know how we are so driven oh. towards challenges. So that, yes, that helped me to complete the book. And I had a lot of jitters, butterflies. You know, I didn't know how it, the book would be received, especially, you know, the first chapter, how it is. So yeah. I was like, you know, quite uh, jittery about it. But thankfully, it did well. And um, yeah, so one thing led to the other because... When I started telling people I've written a, a spiritual thriller, they were like, where is the finance book? So, <laughs> yeah, so that's how what the finance happened. And yeah, one thing led to the other. Not long ago, um, 
I think uh, I had a chance to talk to Sir John Whitmore mm-hmm. when he was uh, uh, doing a podcast series for right. ICF for Hyderabad chapter. Okay. And uh, in that uh, period, I think uh, the Nirbhaya case and few other uh, news, uh, you know, was reaching the main media. And right. uh, Sir John Whitmore was so uh, pained, and I could feel it uh, in his voice through the phone. And uh, he said, uh, "Why should I do a session for your country?" Oops. That really shocked me. He said, uh, "Sir, uh, can you uh, say more?" And then uh, we kept talking, and finally I assured him that there are few bad apples. It doesn't mean you know the country is uh, like that. And he bought my argument, fortunately. And then he uh, came for a session live uh, uh, through virtual, uh, you know, platform and uh, grace the occasion with our audience there. And also, he did one podcast uh, episode. So, uh, why I'm sharing this with you is uh, such a humble person, uh, you know, got touched by uh, news that he read on on the media, and uh, it really disturbs you know many people across the globe how women are treated in this country. And uh, your your book is also uh, you know helping uh, the healing process in that uh, sense, I should say. and it's easier to talk about uh, you know women empowerment but uh, it's very difficult to live that moment and uh, show by example so i'm sure more power to you and many other women who are uh, you know speeding ahead and you know surging ahead it's important that we are known for our uh, you know diversity and tolerance and so on right yeah. so let me uh, move on to the next uh, part of our uh, interaction uh, your previous book what the finance is a best seller right uh, and you wrote this uh, get high now uh, where is the mula yeah. what is difference in each of these books right so if you were to look of course a glance at the unknown is a spiritual thriller what uh, what the finance is uh, it talks about the practical challenges that you know businesses face and what are the solutions now i didn't want to make it like a regular finance book so i said you know how can i make it a lot more interesting and practical more than anything so i made it as challenges and what can be the solutions and uh, it's mainly for businesses and given them from a finance perspective right so because businesses need to know how to manage themselves financially because i believe finance is the backbone of any organization any business yes. so i that is the approach i took there and i introduced the people to you know few of the concepts from a finance perspective and what they need to do like you know how they should be managing their revenue how they should be managing their cost their cash uh, you know so on and so forth compliances and stuff like that so that's what the finance and then get high of course uh, it is how to coach yourself for high performance in your work so it's an activity based book and if you ask me i would say it's a prequel to what the finance because i believe high performance leads to high profit so i say hp for hp right so yeah. it is you know to trigger your thoughts to see how you can coach yourself and bring out the best as a high performance and uh, where's the mula is um, you know it pivots on finance it talks about the business wheel and how each function of the business can contribute for better profitability and you know manage your cash efficiently so at a very high level i think these are the differences but one thing i would like to also add is you know what is common amongst all mm. of these so what is common is all of them are simple yeah and easy to implement i would say perfect perfect and i was just thinking about uh, your uh, stint in botswana yes right? and uh, you had a chance to work with uh, large organizations as well as uh, grassroots change makers you are a change maker uh, yourself right uh, how did you navigate all the cultural differences you you also spoke about uh, sri lankans and you know uh, uh, africans and many other cultures living together and you got to know many things uh, as a uh, experience right so how right. that experience shaped you into who you are now uh i was in botswana with pricewana house coopers for 8 years and that was like a totally different world and journey and i would say since it was at the start of my almost at the start of my career that's what molded me into the professional that i am today so like you said you know i really had the exciting opportunity to work with many different people different backgrounds 
you know different culture and uh, it opened me up to a lot newer perspectives and like right. you know how steve job says when you connect the dots you know so there with in price what house coopers i was uh, in charge of the entrepreneurial advisory division so now when i look back you know i said yeah it makes sense because i know how it is to work with entrepreneurs and today like you know i'm a coach working with people from different backgrounds so that again has helped me to you know connect better uh, you know uh, relate more to people from their culture thing because when you talk about their culture and the country to you know somebody else from their own country you know it definitely helps you connect better and you gel well right so that way it has definitely helped me and it has been a great journey for me wonderful wonderful in fact uh, uh, a finance person who is a hardcore number driven uh, more of uh, you know show me the money uh, that's the title of the show today show me the money kind of a person uh, otherwise uh, you know what you are saying and what you are doing are not aligned however uh, you have also got certified yourself as a professional uh, certified coach uh, with icf and how's that uh, uh, you know uh, helped you in uh, being a game enabler as you call yourself okay that's a great question so the thing is to be very honest till i started my coaching journey i didn't know who a coach is or what exactly a coach does right you know like most people i thought a coach is probably a mentor or a domain expert and stuff like that so it's pretty strange that you know at the during the launch of my book uh, glance at the unknown around that time whoever i interacted with you know there would be something or the other i would hear about coaching it was either that they were a coach or they were undergoing coach training or they were telling me they were working with a coach so it was like suddenly i started hearing so much about coach so that kind of you know made me curious i said wait what is this coaching all about and i was told you know you have to get yourself trained it happens in bombay delhi and all that so i said forget it but luckily i got to know that it happens right here in chennai where i am and guess what it was happening almost next door to where i live so i said no i need to grab this opportunity so i went ahead you know i i was just more out of curiosity so that i started and uh, i really got hooked on to it i loved it because you know i realized i'm able to contribute and able to add value to people and make a difference so that really got, got me pumped up and i said yes i this is what i want to do but again you know after i started as a coach and i was still working full time initially i was looking at you know my finance experience of you know more than two decades and the coaching as two separate things and then much later it was like a an aha moment because i realized yes. you know i can actually combine the two because and that's why i say i'm a business and leadership coach so i work with corporate leaders enabling high performance and enhancing financial growth of course corporate leaders and entrepreneurs so basically that's what i do and i realize okay that is my sweet spot what i really want to be doing nice nice and uh, let me ask you this uh, question which has been lingering on uh, you, you know my mind why this title where is the mula <laughs> yeah so what i say is you take any business tell me why does a business exist right to make what money. is your <laughs> sorry to make money absolutely so not many people get that in the sense they say you know i want to serve customers um i am very passionate about what i do all that is true i'm not denying it but then what is the difference between business and charity you know mm -hmm. even in charity you want to serve your customers you are very passionate about it and so on and so forth but the differentiating factor is your profits you know your business exists to make money now like we know the last few years i mean last one and a half years especially has been extra challenging on businesses yes. and i've noticed entrepreneurs you know leaders i mean anybody who's working you know they've been sweating it out so much you know giving so much to the work that they're doing and at the end of the day you know you're wondering where's the money where's the moolah mm -hmm. because you know after doing all that you know that's a very natural thought like you know hey i've done so much put in so much efforts but where is it so that was the thought that was there in me and uh, actually i was brainstorming whether i should have it as where is the mula or where is the money because mm. money is something common but then where is the mula sounds better 
so you know we had a long discussion with the publisher sage and then we finally said okay fine uh, let's go with where's the mula because i also checked with few other people maybe uh, the audience who are watching us live can tell us what they like is it where's the money or where's the mula i definitely like where's the mula and also it helps us to teach a thing or two to all the uh, you know uh, non native hindi speakers across the globe Yes, right? that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And catches attention. It's also, sorry, it's also a slang in English. So it's surprising that people in the West are able to relate and they know what moolah is. But we oh, yeah, are down south. Many people down south in India, uh, not many people yeah. are familiar with the moolah. They, uh, in fact, somebody asked me, "Oh, where's the moolah?" <laughs> right? You know, so <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I had to clarify there. Yeah. interesting and uh, yeah many uh, indian words different uh, language from india have reached oxford dictionary maybe this would be there as well yeah yeah so uh, in, in this book uh, you talk about uh, various uh, things including uh, suppliers right uh, i have not seen many people talk about them in an empathetic uh, manner because uh, they are the you know linchpin of sort without uh, just in time supply or you know cost effective supply the business cannot exist and this is true for a small and medium enterprise in a manufacturing uh, setup what made you devote a full chapter for uh, managing suppliers right so if you notice you know if you look at the business wheel there are different functions right and suppliers your vendors are also contributing right so if you notice the book where's the mula um, is there to tell you how each function can contribute for better profitability and better cash flow so definitely your suppliers and vendors play a huge role in it of course if you're manufacturing then you're totally dependent on your suppliers but even if you're not manufacturing you are dependent on your vendors right because all your money uh, you know your money outflow is towards your suppliers and vendors apart from of course your employees and other things so that definitely forms a great part of the entire business chain the, the business mm. deal that i say so i had to you know do justice and talk about the suppliers as well absolutely right and uh, for your question earlier uh, sangeeta we got uh, yeah audience uh, cheering There are many oh. plans and uh, yeah, thumbs up for Mula. It's catchy, and we Super, also got a uh, recommendation. Rokda or Kasu would have been local translated. Yes. Yeah, that would and, have been too local. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And uh, let me uh, move on to a uh, few other questions which I managed to uh, crafted uh, crafted for you. you also talk about uka but not in the traditional sense of v u c a you have added r and d to it make it uka and i really love the positive spin that you have uh, put in for uh, uka could you tell us about that piece right yeah so like we you know i mean there's too much of uka that everybody has been talking about which is of course volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous but i realized it's not just vuka and i call it vuk card like you say the r and the d so the r is the risks you know anything and everything about business is a risk right and businesses have to take risk because taking no risk is the biggest risk right mm, so yeah. businesses have to take the risk but how should they be taking you know they need to take calculated risks and uh, the book also i have touched upon the various hues of risk like you know good risk bad risk financial risk and so on so the r yes. is about the the risk and d is about disruption now if you notice disruption has always been there but we seem to talk more about disruption right now simply because the speed of disruption is much faster than before Absolutely. so that is why i call it vuka you know so that's volatile uncertain complex ambiguous risky and disruptive so what i've also said is you know disrupt or be ready to get disrupted so yes. like how they say a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose so i said like you know how do you handle the vuka the vuka is a vuka is a vuka so i have also spoken about the kind of emotions that are related with vuka how to tackle this vuka and what is the effect of the book card so that's the spin that i have given there in the book absolutely and for those uh, listeners who are watching this uh, please do 
uh, access this book on Amazon or uh, various other platforms that is available. It's a wonderful, easy breeze. And uh, Sangeeta, just to uh, you know, quench my curiosity, you, you have spoken to so many business leaders, celebrities, and uh, successful and accomplished people in the world of business. Yeah. And uh, how did they react when you approached them for, for a sound bite or you know, to interact for a book uh, of this nature? Right. So I must say that all these guys who have interviewed for both What the Finance as well as uh, Where's the Moolah, they have been amazing. They have been so nice to, uh, you know, share their knowledge, share their time and, you know, explain and, you know, kind of walk me through their journey. So that has been like phenomenally good. And um, it's so nice to interact and, you know, uh, gain insights from their knowledge. And also some of them have been very nice to talk about the mistakes that they've made, you know. So what I always say is, you know, you don't, everybody doesn't have to do all the mistakes. When somebody has done it and, you know, been there, done it. So we might as well learn from others' mistakes and so that we don't really have to repeat the same mistakes. So that is what I say. So they have shared all of this. So it has been uh, absolutely uh, amazing interacting with them. So how I actually got about with them was most of them have been within my network. If not, I have, you know, reached out to them either on platforms like LinkedIn or you know, they say there's only a sixth degree of separation, right? So most of them were thankfully within my second degree of separation itself. So somebody or the other introduced me and then got about talking to them. So it has been absolutely great. But I must also admit there have been, there was in fact one particular, not a very pleasant uh, incident in the sense, you know, there was somebody who was um, second degree separation. He was very keen to be featured in the book, but then, you know, uh, he kept giving me time slots. And then the first two times he said in the last minute that he was not able to make it. So I said, that's fine. But the third time again, you know, I was there waiting online and uh, the person never pitched up and, you know, didn't come back to me. So that was a little, I mean, you don't expect senior leaders to behave in such a manner, but uh, I guess it happens for whatever reasons and everything happens for good. So that was okay. I mean, whoever was the best to share their knowledge, I think they have all been featured. So that way it has been amazing and wonderful. And I'm very grateful to all these people for sharing their inputs. In fact, as you speak, uh, what I recollect is the higher people go, the more humble they become. Yes. That's how yes. my experience has been. Uh, yes. Whenever I worked with uh, you know, not many professionals who are uh, you know, been there, done that kind of yes. uh, Right. Yes, I would, I would definitely uh, second you there because this particular person is below 40. So probably, I mean, though he is in a very senior position in large and won awards and all that, but I guess, you know, all this humbleness and the maturity probably comes with age. So I guess, uh, of course, there yeah. are exceptions to everything. Yeah, but yes. A friend of mine uh, in uh, Europe, he, mm -hmm. he said, uh, one has to go through University of Hard Knocks. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I've been there uh, many times when I felt I have reached and I have arrived. Uh, I got a little uh, reminder on my head to say, hey, you know what? You have much more to learn. Yeah. So uh, a request to all the audience on online, uh, on YouTube, LinkedIn, as well as Facebook. Please do drop in a message saying where you are logging in from and uh, a brief about uh, your uh, thought or idea on this topic. The question, if you have. Uh, or uh, please do have question for Sangeeta so that we can extract more value from her presence today with us. Thank you. So let me go back to the book. In the book, you talk about something called fake stake syndrome. Yes. Could you uh, tell us more about that, please? Right. So this is again something that happened uh, in real. So there was uh, an entrepreneur. Who, who's more of a who's more of an acquaintance so the person said you know can i can we just meet up for coffee so i said okay so we met and then uh, i mean after our normal greetings the person was asking me uh, would you know any investors who can invest into my business now when this question was being asked i guess probably thanks to the coaching or whatever you know i sensed there was a lot of pain in the eyes and kind of a lot of despair in the voice so, you know how coaches we are. So I kind of started probing a little bit there. So I wanted to know, you know, what was 
wanting this extra investment for the business because the business was existing for over a decade and uh, to my knowledge it was flourishing so then slowly the person starts to open up and business was having a lot of cash flow issues and this was pre pandemic all right mm. so then obviously i started you know digging deeper finding out what exactly was mm. causing it and you know went through like a typical coaching conversation to find out more and then what we realized was or rather what the entrepreneur realized was getting the investment is not really going to solve the problem it may it but probably mm. only for a short term now yeah. the thing was they needed to get to the root cause to see what was really causing it and you know the person was able to identify three four different areas on what was really causing it and so we decided that unless that is getting going to get plugged you don't really get an investment just to manage your day to day cash flow issues so that was like an eye opener so that is what i coined the term saying fake stake syndrome because if you're not going to really set things right within your business and then you know you just think getting an investor on board and the investment is going to make your life easier that's not really what happens every time so that's what i wanted to caution them about uh, you know the fake stake syndrome watch out so investment is good but then get your processes and everything intact Yeah, otherwise it will become a bottomless pit. How much ever money you put in, it's not going to be enough. Yes. And in fact, uh, towards the end of the book, I think you speak about uh, essentialism. Yes. How uh, you know, as a, a business leader or a, a entrepreneur or owner of the business, one need to adopt essentialism. Could you share more about that, please? Yes. Yes. So yes, I call it the principle of essentialism. So you know what I say, be it this. principle of essentialism can be used for your individual you know personal finance as well as business finance now if you were to kind of classify you know uh, your expenses and other things as the, according to the principle of essentialism they could be highly essential mm. essential or non essential now of course highly essential is a no brainer you have to you know incur that and non essential also is not a problem because you know you can probably do away with it but the gray area is something that's essential right because you want to have it but then you're not quite sure types so how should one really manage about that so that is what uh, the principle of essentialism is all about so what i have said is you know instead of uh, you know feeling constrained that you know you you don't really want to pinch your pennies every time so yeah. what i say is um, you know give yourself a leeway like you know it could either be like a percentage of your income or your revenue or a fixed amount to say that you know i will not go beyond x amount something like mm-hmm. that or x percent of my revenue or you know your my cash inflow and stuff like that so you're able to keep a tab right and yes. you're uh, you you don't feel that uh, that pinch as such so that is what uh, i have spoken about in principle of essentialism absolutely and uh, quite contrast people do practice or at least in my experience i have seen them practice minimalism at the cost of uh, you know hurting their own business where they have to spend they would not they they have a very tight purse string where uh, they need not spend they just splurge the money thinking that you know uh, they'll get some returns yeah True. absolutely right yeah. Yes. So, in fact, I'm reminded of a coaching conversation I had with an entrepreneur. This is like a, a favorite example of mine. So, uh, you know, the person is from a non-tech background, and uh, he had just built his new website, and you know, he had invested considerable amount of time, in, made a beautiful website. You know, understanding how to build, and then you know, coming up with everything for it. So, at the start of our coaching conversation, you know, he was very excited, and then he told me, hey, you know, I've just built this co- website. How is it? So, yeah, looks good. I said, very nice. So, the our topic for the coaching conversation of that particular day was he wanted to see how to grow his revenue. Mm-hmm. Now, when I asked him what was actually, you know, stopping him because if he wants to grow his revenue, so he was telling me that, oh, you know, I'm so pressed for time. Mm-hmm. I actually have a lot of leads in the pipeline, and you know, it's just a question mm-hmm. of me going and uh, talking to them, interacting to them, and I'm quite positive that I'll be able to convert them into uh, my revenue. So to me, you know, the two are striking. He has, mm-hmm. you know, spent so much time in the website. Of course, a great job, and the idea was. he didn't want to spend you know he didn't want to outsource doing it but then so i asked him so i said uh, you know the considering that x number of hours that you have 
put in in building the website supposing mm-hmm. you had spent it with your potential customers you know so what would have been more beneficial for you and he was like oh yes you know <laughs> i should yeah you know i just was being penny wise and found foolish so you know mm-hmm. these are uh, little things and you're very right in saying people just tend want to uh, control the cost and not realizing at what cost true in fact I, this reminds me seven or eight years ago i was uh, empaneled by a family owned business to coach all the ceos and uh, direct reports of uh, six seven companies that the family uh, right. had right and uh, one of the statements which often repeated across all the boardroom meetings is what is the best use of your time right uh, because uh, i found in one flagship company they spent uh, more than 16 hours uh, in uh, meetings in a week Oops. Oops. right and when the realization happened uh, the leader quickly cut it down to six and then took a target uh, upon himself to say i would do it in two so uh, imagine the kind of uh, free time people yes. down the line in his uh, organization got to engage with the end customer true true otherwise they would be spending time in a closed room yes. Uh, yes. you know not doing lots productive. of things which are not productive yeah absolutely yes. yeah so i think since time is an uh, you know free resource people just tend to take it for granted and adding to that uh, we lack competence in putting value for that time monetary value true right? very true so the web- website example that you gave if i had to give 15000 rupees to a freelancer who would do a good job without me getting involved or my time taken away uh, i tried to do it myself that 15000 turns out to be four days or five days of my time which is like too much right yes yeah, absolutely yes. Indeed. Yeah. So, uh, and I think there are a lot of coaches out there listening to this. Uh, it's not just for our clients, even for ourselves when we are running a business, yes. freelancing. Yeah. So, say, say something about what common mistakes coaches do in managing their money. <laughs> yeah, I guess to each. Yeah, that will be another book, Sangeeta. You can write another <laughs> book on that. <laughs> yeah. So, what are so the I... images that we have? Yeah. Yes. So the revenue leakages is like, you know, what we discussed, like not taking into account the, your time that you're spending on each engagement or assignment, because, you know, we sign up for something, but then we realize, oh my God, this actually involves so many other things. So, you know, not taking into account your time, not managing your uh, money properly, not, uh, you know, probably you are undercoating and then not ensuring that, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of getting the business and uh, ensuring you know, you're not doing justice to it or probably you're not invoicing on time or not collecting on time or probably sometimes even miss to raise an invoice. So these are some of the yeah. common things, you know, not just coaches, many people. Yeah. So I'm too busy to raise invoices. <laughs> yes. And it's easy to you're sell lazy. a product. It's easy to, yeah. easy to sell a product, but not a service. And that service happens to be me as a brand. It makes it even more difficult, right? True. And Gopal is asking or, or exclaiming, the right uh, sentence how to sell yeah <laughs> Absolutely yes. Yes. in fact uh, uh, in, in the book throughout uh, in each of the 10 chapters you have a wheel right yeah. i know uh, when i got introduced to coaching way back in 2007 the first thing you know uh, they uh, mentioned is uh, do wheel of life yes and since then i have used wheel of life in various contexts uh, in different uh, setting with different kinds of clientele and so on. And I could see a semblance of wheel of life in uh, each of these. Uh, could you say more about how did you arrive at this hack uh, concept? And uh, it's so insightful, you know, each chapter, whether it is a marketing, whether it is operations, whether it is supply, uh, supplier network, each of these chapter, uh, you have a wonderful wheel, uh, which is so insightful, one can go deeper, one can dissect as a business owner, uh, one can be richer by just focusing on one wheel at a time so that all these 10 wheels can make a very good uh, business uh, model. So can you say, say more about that, please? Yes. So, yeah, that's a great point that you brought about. So like what I say, little drops of, ocean, little drops of water makes the mighty ocean. 
right mm-hmm. so that is what happens in a business as well now if you look at a business you know all these different components is what actually makes the business so you can't isolate finance alone or you know you can't just say oh i need my business uh, you know to grow financially but then if each of these business functions can contribute better for the business to grow that makes a lot of difference so that is what i realized so you know i've spoken about these different functions and what is it that each function can do so that is why i made it as a uh, i call it the hack wheel of each business function so that you know the moment you look at it you know yes okay these are the areas i really need to focus on on each business function like um, talking about people you know so i said people are your biggest assets you know so how are you leveraging their strengths in building high performance teams and then one other thing that uh, many people don't realize uh, is again this is from the book trillion dollar coach compensation has an emotional value to it right so people don't look at compensation just as uh, the money but there is a lot more to it so how is it the business can you know leverage on their strengths you know and ensure that you know you pay your people well because you want the best output from them as well so looking at different aspects so similarly on marketing you know i've spoken about the different ways like you said uh, digital marketing collaborative uh, frugal marketing referral marketing you know different aspects what is it that you can do and i've also given these uh, uh, little stories you know things that can inspire or you know trigger different thought ideas uh, so that's what i've done and yeah again i think on uh, the customer Yes. I spoke about yeah, how to delight the customer, and you know what sort of customer experience is being given. So you know here I would like to uh, uh, share this that is shared in the book as well. So there's a, a shop here in Chennai. It's called the uh, Kashmir Emporium, right? They sell artifacts from Kashmir. It's a beautiful shop, and they have beautiful stuff as well. So every time a person visits them, you know, so they serve the customer. Uh, the the kashmiri tea is called the kahwa uh, with oh. along with fresh uh, almonds right so it's such a delight like you know you go there you feel so warm and welcome i mean these are small little things but then you know it goes a long way in uh, giving the customer the right kind of experience so those are the little real life examples that i have uh, integrated into the book absolutely and i like the uh, way the chapter starts with cadbury's uh, and few other companies which Uh, started hyper local marketing to save small uh, neighborhood uh, shops during the first wave of pandemic correct and, and your take is really right uh, if we don't have the ecosystem of the local uh, shops and uh, finding ways to save them it's going to be a huge uh, chaos and a big systemic uh, you know challenge true right for all of us yes yeah uh, it's already showing up in the way uh, people are falling below the uh, you know poverty line uh, because it's all you know each day's selling uh, or sales that they do is going to help their family to be lifted out of poverty and Very when we don't uh, you know encourage them or uh, support them it's going to be tough pandemic though it is really uh, you know uh, pain in the wrong area but uh, i think that it has done some good to all of us as well to learn to adopt to technology in a much more uh, in systemic manner uh, there are people who have never been uh, online uh, you know as a shopping experience they have started doing it now they started uh, there is a dopamine dressing coming up you know that right people yeah. just dress up to lift their mood uh, since they Very are not going out or uh, you know to their work Uh, yes. dopamine pressing i'm yes. sure this will have an impact on children who are born in this period right and, and how to oh, make sure. this one uh, experience which i had early on uh, to go out and earn money by working in a medical shop there in chennai mm-hmm. my grandfather was the one who pushed me to say hey work in this medical shop you will get to know what is pharmacy because uh, you are going to do pharmacy as if he was a fortune uh, teller he prompted that you know i am going to do pharmacy But in my mind at that time, uh, I think it was about 10th standard, 11th standard. I was very clear. I'm going to become a doctor. I don't want any pharmacy. But um, as fate would have it, I, I ended up being a pharmacist. Uh, my experience in that shop taught me many things. One of them is how to value money. Oh, wow. Interesting. It's going to be a good, interesting time for all our kids to yes. you know, realize the value of money. 
and my younger one she is uh, nine and a half years now when she was very young she would accompany uh, my wife uh, to atm to withdraw money right uh, i think she was about one and a half to two years old and uh, my wife was depositing cash in the machine and, and i was told later on saying the younger one she started crying that machine ate money it's a hard earned money <laughs> Machine is supposed to give you money. How can it eat money? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we are learning like that, like yes, a kid. Yes, uh, absolutely. Not think to this new change. You talk about technology, IT, uh, how important it is for a finance person. Could you elaborate on why a finance person should take interest in any transformation project or how IT function can, uh, you know, bring money? These are the hidden places where treasure is there. Under yes. the carpet, and a finance person or a business head or owner is not looking in these Correct. places. Yes. So, like we know, this is the digital era that we are in, and uh, everything is happening digitally, right? So, you need to leverage on the strength of technology and see how the processes can become more faster and efficient. So, that is something very, very important. And finance and technology kind of go together, I would say, because. that's where the mood well, the world is headed towards now so while technology is so important and you also uh, you know need to see how you can uh, blend in with your business at the same time the security risks are also something that one needs to take care of you know you can't just uh, leave the security aspect because so many online frauds are happening right the cyber security and stuff like that so that is also important so you can't just blindly go you'll have to see what fits in well into your business and also uh, i think uh, for a finance professional they need to look at uh, analytics right and then mm -hmm. interpret it so everything is dependent on technology robotics right so we'll have to just uh, see what is the best fit for the business that each person is into and then see how you can leverage that to make the best and efficient and faster use for the business true true and by 2025 many of the research uh, you know articles predict that millennials would be 75% of the workforce and it's not very far from now Yeah. And uh, also, Gen Z has already started, uh, you, you know, uh, participating in the workforce, uh, either as a startup ecosystem or uh, they are part of, uh, you know, a growing company or established company. And the second insight which uh, I got in the recent time is longevity of a company is also reducing. Earlier, the companies were living for sixty years and you know eighty or uh, some like Tata's go for hundred. Uh, but now uh, long uh, human longevity has you know increased uh, our retirement age 60 doesn't make sense anymore people right. are active and they have a very good lifestyle they go beyond uh, in 70 and work yes. now uh, the role is reversing right one cannot expect to spend all his lifetime or her lifetime in a company they have to navigate beyond the one so uh, as a finance person and a coach what advice would you have for people who are uh, designing their career uh, not living as a default so as i said in the beginning you have to see what really drives you what is your intent what is it that you want to achieve right uh, and like i say you know your purpose have you identified your purpose and your purpose should be obviously much beyond just the money just the moolah it has to be something much beyond so that is very important so once you are able to identify that and see what resonates from deep within and you know get the clarity and awareness i think then you're probably on the right path yes it doesn't happen overnight it would take some time but uh, if you're constantly kind of you know mulling on that i'm sure something would open up absolutely yeah uh, when we know why we are starting a journey right then the path will emerge uh, accordingly yes. yeah absolutely yes, that's right yeah start with why yeah yes and uh, one other thing about uh, your book i found you are very fascinated with acronyms a b c d e you know uh, uh, even in career you have a acronym uh, you have four m mission so what purpose all these acronyms serve for a finance person uh, i am still curious right right so it's not just for a finance person it's for anybody and the reason i use acronyms is simply because of 
recall value is higher right and uh, you know at the flash like you know you know okay yeah this is what i need to do so like like you would have observed uh, i have used many acronyms like tom tom uh, yes. pitch price the three w's cash risk i mean quite a few of them so like the price acronym is to see what sort of your pricing strategy that you know can be used and then the probably i should talk about pitch pitch you know uh, you want to go and pitch your business to your investors right so if pitch were to be an acronym what are the important things that uh, you know you need to cover in a pitching session so i say p stands for problem what is the problem that your business is solving so you know you should start with that so that the investors know okay this is what the business is meant to do and you know how are you adding more value to your customers what is the pain point that you are solving so p is the problem that's being solved i is the investment required so what is the kind of investment that you need that you are asking your investors and of course you know what you uh, propose to do with the investment t is the team composition so you know who comprises of your team so who are your co-founders um, who are your advisors your auditors your coaches your mentors domain experts you know so talk about all the team that has been involved and then c is um, what to see yeah c is the customer so you talk about the customer and the go to strategy to the market so how are you planning to grow your customer base right because to do your business successfully you need your customers so where are your customers which are the territories that you planning to operate from and you know how you planning to grow it and scale it further so c is the customers and h is the high level information so high level information financial information so at a very high level you know you speak about the, the actual financial results uh, the margins uh, your cash position and uh, the financial projections as well so where how do you think the business can progress uh, you know because end of the day what will your investors make by investing in your business so you need to give your financial projections as well so that is how i've kind of broken it down and then you know made it easy for people because i have sat through quite a few pitch sessions and i noticed you know probably they don't cover all aspects so this way you know i made it easy for them to say okay it's more like a checklist to see okay i have touched upon this touch upon this or at least be prepared for the probable questions from the potential investors so that's how i have made uh, these different acronyms so that uh, people know what they need to do all these are very sticky and for a person who is aspiring to uh, grow their business and be a profitable one and also search for all the hidden treasures and money all over the place i think this is fantastic you also break the myth of siloed functions if i am a finance person or a hr or a it i need to look after only my domain that silo you have broken with yes. the wheel the hacks yes. that you got right. with uh, all the templates that you have shared i think these templates are worth a fortune Thanks. i don't think any of these templates are available in any uh, you know expensive executive programs uh, or even in b school uh, for that matter after you are pushed into the you know the swimming pool of life uh, you have no one to take care of uh, your uh, you know day to day needs or issues uh, that's when you are recommending that go for a coach or a mentor who would help you think through these issues and this becomes a wonderful ready reckoner uh yes. you can't always dial a person and uh, you know the coach becomes a crutch then uh, so, instead you have a ready reckoner where all the templates are available you can reflect you can think through the questions that you have given listen to all the leaders who have spoken about uh, you know the challenges that they faced in their career uh, in that particular aspect you have chosen one uh, business leader for one section yeah. that's really uh, commendable uh like for example uh, ms umara for the first one uh, on yeah. the people part and yes. for customer for investor for supplier in each of these sections you have chosen one leader i think it's a wonderful effort uh, one question i have is about uh, the forest uh, principle that you talk at the end uh, could right. you say more about the forest principle for our yes. audience yes so when you when i say forest you know what comes to your mind you know it's like these huge trees many trees different varieties you know abundance and all is what 
you think when you say forest right so i thought how can that concept be used in a business or even in an individual in fact i've spoken about the forest principle in my tedx talk as well so how can what is it that we can learn from a forest you know when it comes to the business so the example i would state here is if you were to look at mcdonalds right where do you think mcdonalds makes its money from it's not just from you know the chicken nuggets and fries. <laughs> yes but it's a lot more right so for a business to be successful or even for an individual uh, i believe you need to have multiple streams of revenue right, right. because that's what is going to help you to grow and scale because then you don't really have to pay any pinch because you're sure that you know you have abundant revenue that's been coming in so that's why i say have multiple streams so it can be like your interest income rental income royalty income investment income you know you can have different products different services maybe licenses so just you'll have to just think and see what is the value that you can add to your potential customer so that you are having multiple streams of revenue right because you have good income then you know you don't really have to bother about the other aspects so much so that's uh, it's to see the forest principle is basically to see how you can get more comfortable financially so that is the idea behind forest principle because uh, i love nature and then see what is it that we can learn from nature so that's why i called it the forest principle right right and also uh, i'm quite a fan of your 4m strategy for all those uh, listening in uh, motto sangeeta your motto is to share your knowledge through social media which you have been doing you have a very active instagram facebook youtube uh, channel as well linkedin linkedin yes yes, yes. and i'm sure uh, you, you will give a tough fight for money for all the gen z out there who are uh, really uh, digital natives and your second m is on mission you are on a mission to enable empower and elevate business and individual yes that's fantastic Uh, and you have been doing it through all your products and service and and the talks that you do uh, in various forum freely sharing your uh, knowledge the measure you have for yourself is the number of lives you touch as a coach author and speaker uh, yeah that's amazing and finally the message i leave that to you what message uh, you have for uh, all of us yes so firstly i want to acknowledge and appreciate you for having taken the extra time out so that you know this is i have not mentioned anywhere but i have mentioned it in the book nightingale's tree where my life story has been featured so thanks for uh, reading that i know i didn't tell you about it but then yeah it is nice that you know you went and uh, read that and then you're quoting about the 4m here so thank you for that so the message i would like to share is you know many times we tend to underestimate ourselves we don't really know our potential right yeah. so it's easy to say um okay you know i'm happy in my comfort zone and i don't really want to step out but unless you step out you never know what is it that you are capable of you know so that is what i say so just go ahead uh, give your best live to your maximizing your potential because you never know what can happen because i always quote the example of me being an accidental author you know so i was within my comfort zone i didn't want to come out i didn't want to write initially so even after the cambodia trip it took me almost uh, it only after 2 years my first book a glance of the unknown came out so you know till then yeah i was within the comfort zone and i didn't want to step out so you never know what happens so just go ahead and uh, live your dreams the way you want to awesome so uh, i'm going to take up that and uh, i i will soon work on my first uh, book i should say Great. let me declare awesome. it open so that i can work on it yes yes and you will be accountable to me yes that's a fact yeah good uh, so sangeeta one last question about the book uh, if i don't ask this it won't be uh, complete right and it won't do justice to where's the mula typically the investors are the one who need to be happy right as a business owner as an entrepreneur as a startup founder how do i make a investor happy and you brought a very insightful depiction uh, in the form of a smiley face with two eyes and ears and a smiling uh, you know can you please say more about that to our audience right so this is a pretty funny one because uh, 
I came up with this smiley face. I mean, it's not, you know, okay, before that, I should even clarify. So investors, it's not just for the startups, but any investors, you know, it could be the shareholders of a large company, or even if you're a solopreneur, you're your own investor, you've invested into your business. So uh, anybody who's invested into your business is an investor. So uh, this is like more than about 10, 15 years ago. So I was uh, preparing myself to go for an uh, interview in one of the uh, my dream job companies, right? So uh, I had kind of prepared this, uh, the, the smiley face at that point in time. So, you know, when I was just thinking about different things, somehow this just popped into my mind and I remembered it now so that I used it. So like you said, you know, what I say is um, the two eyes, are the performance and finance. So, you know, I, again, like, you know, connecting the dots, I realized that's what I'm doing right now with performance and finance is what I enable high performance and enhance financial growth. So, I, you know, I call them as the eyes of the business. So even though it's E-Y-E-S and, you know, and I'm an acronym person, so I changed it as I-C-E. So what does each I stand for? So on the performance, the I is the innovation, C is customer satisfaction and E is the excellence. So once you excel in your performance through innovation, customer satisfaction and uh, uh, excellence, you're doing well in the performance. So financially, what is the ICE? I is for your internal control, C is your um, cost control and E is your efficiency level. So that is on the finance. And then if you had a nose in the smiley face as a triangle, the three things that you need to be worry of is uh, your strategy, the technology and your expertise. And what about the two years? So the years is like one is the risk and the other is your industry trends. You need to know what is happening with competition as well, right? So you need to manage your risks as well as your industry trends. Now, when you do all this, so what happens? It brings about a smile in the investor's face. So how does the smile look like? You know, I say it's increased in productivity increasing your profits and increasing the shareholders returns which is what makes it as a smiley face perfect fantastic and uh, i think all of these models and uh, you know uh, easy to remember acronyms and uh, cheat sheets templates it's tremendous value for someone who is uh, owning their business and wondering where am i making mistakes so this, I, I see it as more like a warning sign for someone who's uh, got their own business. Yes. They uh, ca can catch themselves from uh, making such mistakes in the future yes. when they yes. so, read this book. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, it's not just for business owners and entrepreneurs, but it's also for uh, corporate leaders, you know, who are in charge of P&L or basically anybody who wants to see how they can contribute towards better profitability in a large organization. So... Though it is meant for leaders and uh, business owners, but I think anybody who wants to contribute and learn about how these different functions uh, can be leveraged upon, I think that is uh, a good thing. Perfect. And finally, what message do you have for our audience? I already shared it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So just go ahead. I mean, uh, achieve what you want to. So I would also want to say is, you know, start with a goal. Set yourself with a goal because without a goal, you're like a headless chicken. So go ahead, set yourself goals. And again, you know, probably I can share my acronym once again here. Yeah, so the acronym is TOM, T-O-M, where I say T is your time frame, O is your objectives, and M is to measure. So once you have these three things in place, you know, you know you're working towards uh, achieving what you want in life. So go ahead and uh, you have the potential. So go ahead and get what you want. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. Really appreciate uh, you yeah, taking yeah. time and uh, being part of this interaction. I really enjoyed putting together this material. As you said, uh, I, I love uh, you know researching about my guest. And while I researched about you, uh, I felt the need to do a small kind of uh, teaser to talk about your uh, you know journey and how did you arrive here. I think you inspire many more women out there uh, who are uh, just waiting for a small nudge out of their comfort zone. Yes. So yes. thank you so much. Thank you once again for having me and I enjoyed my interaction with you and wishing you the very best. Thank you. Till we meet again. See you. See you. Bye. -bye. Bye.